Jeremy, you also talk about uh, winner take all kind of dynamics. Yes. Like how do you contrast yeah. these two possibilities? Yeah. Well, I think there are some cross cutting 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 trends, but I think what will happen is this is good for people at. Um, in the bottom sort of to level up, they will be able to enter new professions. Now it doesn't tell you what happens to the people who are already in those professions. I think if you're already mm -hmm. in those professions, as more people enter, you know, you will see, again, if you have somebody who's like the, to use the nurse practitioner example. So nurse, nurse practitioner is a really good profession and really good. If you're, if you're just a standard nurse, for instance, becoming a nurse practitioner is a great thing. But if you're the doctor and now you're saying you're going to get paid what the nurse practitioner is going to get paid. Then you've mm. got, then it doesn't look so good for the doctor. So then, right. the, what, so I think there will be this tendency of, of the wages of the highest earners currently will tend to come down unless they can offer something that is truly extraordinary. And I think for those people, they'll be able to charge sort of whatever they want for their services. So they could actually capture more and more of the value in a, in a given field mm. and potentially use this technology, to extend their services to more people. Um, because it, it might make them that much more efficient. Um, so I do think if you're the top performer in your field, there's a potential here to go out and actually command more. And, and one of the things I talk about is if you're the top lawyer or sort of the top accountant out there uh, or the top investment banker, for instance, th there'll be a tendency, you could probably go off and start your own firm and take all your really high paid clients with you in part because you'll need less support staff than you need ah. now. One of the reasons that those people are kept in, you know, in these firm structures and these large, uh, uh, you know, professional service firms is because they need all the support staff. If suddenly you don't need the support staff, you can go out and you can capture all those clients and command a huge premium and take a big market share potentially. Um, while the firm is kind of left doing the more middling work and they'll still, they'll still earn some money from that. Um, but it'll be less per, professional than maybe they were earning before. So I think those are some of the cross cutting currents we'll see. And that's why I think there will be this kind of star system in a lot of professions where the stars are commanding a huge premium compared to mm. the average worker. Uh, and the average working you know, wage in some of the professions may decline from what it is now. But the point is, it'll still be for somebody who was not in that profession at all, a bump up to join that profession. So that's what I think will happen. So you might see hmm. this lifting of people who are now have been forced kind of into working class jobs back up into the middle class. But then these upper middle class professionals, unless they can offer something that's truly extraordinary, may see themselves kind of just in the middle class because they'll see the, the wage kind of come down potentially. Interesting. You also talk about uh, Engels pause during the British Industrial Revolution. Can you explain that? I thought that was a fascinating Yeah, concept. so this is, this Angle's Pause um, refers to the f this period uh, in the first beginning of the Industrial Revolution from about 1800, late 1790s until about 1868 or so. And in that whole period, mm. you had tremendous increase in labor productivity due to industrialization. So you had mm. all these machines coming online and yet labor was not able to command uh, any higher wages. Wages essentially stagnated. Um, and people, and then after 1868, uh, you see this increase. Labor's share of, of the pie increases kind of rapidly after that. Um, and there's been a lot of speculation about why this is or what caused this to happen. And could this happen again? You know, would this happen with AI? Hmm. Um, if AI is a kind of fourth industrial revolution, are we, are we going to have another angle's pause? Um, the the, the current theory on why this happened is has to do with the design of the machines themselves and the nature of them. The hmm. early, the machines of the early industrial revolution, like the steam engine and the, the, the auto loom in particular, it, what it was competing with, it was competing with highly skilled, um, artisanal labor, um, that was time consuming. It was done sort of craft work in people's houses, cottage industries, um, to operate an auto loom or to operate a steam engine at first took very little skill. Um, all you need was someone, you know, to shovel coal in the furnace or to, you know, kind of work one thing on a loom. It wasn't very hard to do. And so it could be done by a lot of unskilled labor. And you had all these people come off the farms to work in the factories, including a lot of children um, who were sort of the least skilled labor you could imagine. Um, and they were just used. Uh, and there were lots of them because lots of people were coming off the farms to do this stuff. So there was no labor shortage and you didn't need any skills. So people were pretty inter. Uh, changeable. And mm -hmm. you had this period where just labor was was abundant and you didn't need any skilled labor. And so wages, you didn't have to pay very much for that. And factory owners got a huge share of capital. What happens with the second industrial revolution is the machines start getting much more complex. They can do much more. Also, the factories around these machines start to be organized in different ways. You start needing layers of management and administration, which you didn't have in the mm. early factories. The combination of these two things mean you need much more skilled labor in 
your factories and enabled workers who could acquire skills to actually start demanding more for their labor. It was a bigger deal to go on strike suddenly if you needed skilled machinists to operate your equipment than when you could just replace them with a ne the next load of 10 year old kids. Um, so, you know, it was, and yet the other thing is universal educa education came in, in a lot of countries. So the kids were taken out of the equation. I yep. should say that that's, that has also been, you know, I should, you know, in, in intellectual fairness, that is also part of this, this story. And, um, Economists have, have argued quite a bit about how much uh, the uh, the advent of, of mandatory universal education played in the end of Engels' pause. But mm -hmm. the key is that you, you just couldn't use unskilled labor anymore. You couldn't just use kids. And so mm -hmm. you had to pay mm -hmm. more. Um, and the question is, will this happen again? And a lot of it depends on whether AI technology is designed as a direct substitute for human labor or whether it's sort of a complement to human skills. In the case of the early industrial revolution, those things were essentially direct substitutes. You still needed humans to operate them, but they were not, not doing very much that humans really needed to do. So that were human skills that were great, important skills. It was, it was kind of pressing buttons or again, shoveling coal in a furnace. Um, when you get to the second industrial revolution, What's starting to happen there is that you need more human skills. And so those technologies are sort of complementary to human intellectual abilities. Um, and that's when you see an increase in wages. Mm -hmm. And so again, if we can design these systems to be complementary to people, there's a very good chance that we can get both labor, we can get both an increase in overall productivity and an increase in wages. And that would be, of course, mm -hmm. sort of the Goldilocks mm -hmm. scenario. Um, but to have that happen, we really need to design these systems as complements, not as substitutes. The problem with right now is that almost all of our benchmarks, I talk a lot about this in the book, almost all the benchmarks are designed to say, you know, can this beat people at a certain job? It like puts us <laughs> in this framework right away of, everything's a substitute for the person. Um, there's yep. almost no ben benchmarks, like how well does this, do, how well does the person do alone versus how well does the person do with the machine? There aren't very mm -hmm. many, there are few, but there aren't very many benchmark tests on that. AI researchers aren't given like huge rewards for showing that like, oh, the person with the machine did so much better. It's all about like, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, the milestone of beating the person at this game or this particular achievement, or we scored better than, you know, 98% of right. applicants on the, uh, the bar exam. Um, it's not like, well, how do, how well do the, the guys do when they use the AI technology in the bar exam? Um, so I, I think we need to shift our mindset. And Eric, this is something I, I talked to another economist in the, in the, uh, in the book, Eric, uh, Brynjolfsson, uh, Stanford, oh, yeah. who's well known. I mean, this is his whole argument too, that it, we really yeah, we need talked to, about one of his papers. Yeah. That you really need to have people as compliments, not as, as, uh, as substitutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you talk about people as compliments, then you get into this idea of, of centaur chess, which is, you know, the humans that's what they call humans who play alongside machines and it's a kind of mm -hmm. pairing of man and machine um we really kind of need centaur workers going forward i think we really need to look at how do we pair people with ai and what can they do together don't think about this as how do you fire workers think about it as how do my current workers you know do so much more with their current skills when assisted by an ai co-pilot right uh, beautiful well said i, I yeah. uh Comment sections heating up. They say okay. the, industri <laughs> the industrial revolution comparisons he's making are excellent. This one comes from Cole, the analytical, who's a physicist, super smart dude. And he also mentioned the UK trains African nurses for six months and then sends them home. They can deal with maybe 90% of everyday health issues in remote village. And he also made a quip, do we really need more lawyers? Um, <laughs> James, every comment section thinks you're absolutely crushing it. So there's so much more in this book we didn't get to. We didn't get to the warfare aspect and things like that. And that's another reason why you should be buying this book. And for sick members, Jeremy decided to hook us up and give us five free, five free copies. So if you haven't already, join SVIC. And then go to our Discord, and we have a, a channel called a DC Merch Book Giveaways. And if you, I'll have a p post there, and if you want to enter, put your name in there, and then we will raffle off five copies. So Excellent. thank you very much, Jeremy. Jeremy, uh, last question, and then I want to also go and go then do a video of us reacting to um, the the llamas uh, Facebook's llama announcement. Oh yeah, sure. It's relevant to your book. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of kind of a tangent, but sort of related. So we're talking about kids using using computers so much and spending so much time in front of there. I was always thinking, no, I was thinking maybe is this kind of a product of just kids now are living more much more sheltered lives and don't have as much to do and free range like we used to. Um, I'm assuming you're like a you look you get much younger than me, but you're a millennial or Xer or something. I'm an Xer. I'm an okay. Xer. You see, yeah. look younger than me. Look at me. I already yeah, look like yeah, yeah. I'm just like right here. Like I'm like uh, you know, in Raiders Lost Ark, we took the wrong chalice and turned into a skeleton. <laughs> that's basically, that's basically me. Okay, this, this is the question: How you were raised? 
how, how does it compare to how your kids are being raised? Do you feel like you had more free range and more time I spent to more, I, did, I spent more time outside, definitely, than my kids do. And I played, like, I did the classic thing. I grew up in a, a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, and I could like, go on my bike to visit my friends' houses. And we, I, particularly when I was in elementary school, I remember, like, a lot of time spent outside just kind of playing in people's backyards and running through the mm -hmm, parks mm -hmm. and things like that. Then I did, I did have, like, a, a PC at home, and, and it had some games. And my friends, I, I, had, I had, like, an Apple II. E, I remember it was, I think, the first computer I had. Uh, that'll, that'll date me. That'll, that'll tell you yeah. how old I am. And my friends had Commodore 64s, which had better mm -hmm. graphics, actually, at first than the, the Apple did. Um, mm -hmm. And so computer games were starting to become a thing. And we would, like, go over and we would sometimes spend a whole afternoon, like, playing computer games. Um, but then you had to go home. And then also, like, I don't know, our parents did say, like, go outside at some point. And we, we generally did. And I don't remember it being so dominant as it is now. And, and I, and I certainly, we didn't have any sort of portable device that was so compelling as the phone mm. is today as smartphones are. So that was different. And, you know, technology is kind of frustrating to use sometimes. I mean, the games were fun, but like to actually do get your computer to do anything in programming <laughs> took quite a lot of skill. And, you know, they taught us like programming in school, which was like, it seemed like it was sort of frustrating. Some kids got really into it, but I, I never quite got so into it. Um, but I don't know. It just it did seem like we're you know we spent a lot more time interacting with each other uh, directly than than people do now. Um, mm. Even though there were like the early message boards were around and there were people like spending a lot of time online chatting with other people. But it's I mean it's the interface again. I think this has a lot to do with the design of the technology. Um, you know the people who ran like bulletin board services in the old dial up modem days were not optimizing for engagement like there are probably lots of tricks that like you know meta you know has learned that the guy who ran you know the the bbos at like you know case western reserve university or something which i was playing around with when i was a kid didn't um didn't know how to do and so um maybe that's part of it too they just like and i that's what i worry about with ai it's a, it is a pretty compelling technology it sounds it feels like you're you're interacting with a human being um and i think that's dangerous in some to some extent because it become too easy to just well to kind of conflate the two